Cool. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Uzman. Um, thanks for coming to the Hack House here. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging out, come, coming through, talking about all things kind of going on with Avalanche. Um, I'll give it a few minutes. I saw a few people kind of coming, coming over uh, still. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is a fun talk to, to start off the, the event with. Um, reason for that is it, it ties in a lot of uh, really our latest thoughts, at least at Avalabs, on uh, the direction Avalanche should go as it continues to scale and evolve as, as a network. Um, it first starts by taking stock a bit of where we're at, uh, the growth we've seen with Avalanche over the last few years, which has been really fun to be a contributor to, um, and then talks about what uh, really what we think needs to happen on the network for it to continue evolving and staying uh, up to speed uh, with all the other, I guess, like happenings in the space, and I think reflecting our latest insights into, into the best, uh, best of everything that we can do. So, yeah. Uh, so, to start things off, you know, the title, Scaling Thousands of Blockchains, Leveraging Sovereignty to Maximize Capacity. That's a mouthful, you know, I, I'm not a marketer, so that's, uh, that's more Kevin's shtick uh, back there. But um, sovereignty, uh, I think lately in crypto has taken on a bit of a dirty word, like it's, it's now all about shared security and however you can minimize the number of unique validator sets. Um, at Avalanche, and at least at Avalabs, we take a bit of a different perspective and think of not of sovereignty as a hindrance, but really as an opportunity to grow, grow a community, but more importantly, actually as a tool to scale. Um, when you have sovereignty, there isn't this notion of trying to move data or like checkpoint data into some single source, uh, and instead you rely on the natural horizontal scaling uh, that has brought the internet where it is today. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that, and that's really the direction this goes. Uh, this is not a talk about specific VMs, so like if you're trying to understand what our thoughts are on like Starks and Snarks and everything like that, uh, we love that stuff, but it's, it's not going to be in this. This is more so more broadly about what the platform uh, is doing. So um, oh, I got two slides going on. There we go. So this is one of the, my favorite memes uh, that uh, I've, I've whipped up for the first summit. Um, and I think uh, I really like it because I think the vibe is still the same, which is back then no one knew what a subnet was because there wasn't a lot to do with subnets. Uh, but now no one knows what a subnet does because there's so many different things you can do with subnets. Um, and so subnets to me are really, you know, what you want them to be. And I think that that is a, a really great way to go into this uh, presentation and, and the right fr frame framing to go with. But uh, for those that, you know, want a more distilled idea, you know, the core proposition with subnets in a nutshell is you can have validator denominated network cost for scaling, not activity denominated cost for scaling. So the idea there is you have some network, your own network, your own hardware. Uh, when you increase your usage of that hardware, the cost to some other network you're using for coordination, messaging, whatever it is, shouldn't go up. And that's the core idea behind the subnet topology is that uh, based on the number of participants, which is useful to other networks, um, that's where the network cost goes up. But if you increase your like, usage of a single subnet, uh, the cost doesn't go up. And so this is the key difference in really how like the subnet, subnet fee pricing and subnet growth works, which is why uh, we're starting to see, you know, some really interesting growth. Uh, this whole like double thing I have going is not great. Uh, some really interesting growth uh, with subnets. Now, I think the, <laughs> the biggest point is we always want like more, more and more, but it's really fun to see at least with what subnets are without even cross subnet messaging. We've seen really interesting growth um, over the past uh, over the past uh, year or so, uh, or two year and a half, I should say. Um, now, I think the the more fun graph to look at is like I love these like circle graphs because they just look really cool. Um, but there's currently, by my count this morning, uh, 41 subnets. Um, admittedly, you know most of them are EVM based, so people are like, well, why would you come to ETH Denver? Well. Almost all the big developers on subnets are currently running some variant of the EVM. Um, and we, uh, you know, I think would be, be naive to acknowledge that like that's where most developers currently are in the space. And we certainly have aspirations to go, you know, outside of that and offer different experiences, but that's where a lot of, a lot of the developers are. Um, typically these are five to 15 validators per subnet. A lot of people then also ask us, well, like, cool, you brought uh, like enterprise blockchain into this like public space of it, but 
that's not really our final target. Um, and that's me foreshadowing a bit of, of what I think is important uh, as the network continues to grow. Um, Fuji is more fun to look at. So Fuji looks more like a natural network growth. So um, in the middle, and I, I kind of skipped the part of explaining what these circles are and just kind of said they look cool. Um, so these, these small circles in the middle, those are all validators on the primary network. The blue dots are subnets and the red dots are chains. So you can see, at least in, in Fuji, you have a much inter more interesting disbursement of validators into subnets, um, whereas on the main net, almost everybody is just on the primary network still. Um, and that's because, uh, as we've, you know, a lot of people have brought up, uh, there's a pretty tight coupling between uh, the primary network and running a subnet, and that's, you know, again, me foreshadowing of some interesting ideas that I think are worth discussing. So uh, the other thing I'll round it out with is, well, how can you have so many, right? It seems kind of crazy that, at least on Fuji, there's 1,700 different subnets. How can those all be running on a single network? Uh, and the trick there is what I started off with, which is the amount of interactions that there are per chain, per activity, uh, is really just staking operations. So people coming into the subnet or exiting the subnet from a validator perspective. So you know, one of these subnets, you know, maybe have five validators. Well. They all stake for a month. Over that month, there's five transactions. So you can see how there could be so many of these subnets. And how does this work or how is this possible? It's all based on this notion of leveraging sovereignty to maximize capacity. So there isn't any like connection of transactions or data that needs to be propagated elsewhere. Now, the brief aside there, you know, is it for everybody? Do you, some people want to share security? I think that that's a fair statement. My goal isn't to say one is better than the other, but just talk more about like how leveraging that could be really useful. So as I said, this was really fun to see, but it's interesting to note that this is happening and none of these subnets can even talk to each other yet. So this is really just isolated islands all on their own. So in about a week, the activation of Durango uh, will go live. So Durango uh, is currently, I think, at 97% stake acceptance right now. Uh, Durango is going to allow uh, people to, for, for the first time, uh, natively send messages between the C chain and their subnet. So you can move ERC20 tokens from the C chain to your subnet and then back. You can use your, uh, C chain tokens as the native token on your subnet. Um, so we expect to see a lot of really interesting stuff come live in the next few months that utilize this. So imagine you want to have like a USDC payment accelerator. You can just create a subnet that runs on USDC that rewards the validators in USDC with the fees that they, they collect from running and then run at a much lower price point if you want to is, is one interesting example. Um, so there's a QR code up here. Uh, that's a live demo you can run on Fuji that lets you move tokens. Uh, it works on mobile too as long as you have a Web3 wallet. Uh, from the C chain to two different subnets that we set up for testing. Um, so this is one of those easy ideas that seems obvious that just took four years to figure out how to do right. So uh, we're, we're very excited for that and think that it's going to mean a lot uh, on a go forward basis. Um, so as we think more deeply and like uh, on a longer term basis for really what the Avalanche network can be and what it should do, um, I think it makes sense to talk about where we're trying to go, which is, I think, as someone put on Twitter very elegantly, many fast chains. <laughs> I think the third word there is many fast, high capacity chains. Um, and so the idea here is in that world where you have individual chains that are pushing thousands of transactions, what useful service or coordination service can the primary network provide? Right now, the primary network typically runs at a throughput that's at the same or even greater than a lot of different subnets. In that world, there are scalable and non-scalable things to do. Um, if we were to say, what's the most useful but also scalable services that a, that a platform for launching platforms can provide, uh, most people, I think myself included, land on this world of coordination as one of the primary use, use cases and liquidity. So things that don't require frequent interaction with this like massive world of subnets, uh, but still provide clear value that would be nice to have so you don't have to have this uh, per connection or per subnet overhead that you incur. Um, some people also say you could have some sort of security that comes out of that, but I think the, the most important thing and the, the killer feature of the primary network at this point is coordination. It keeps track of 
exactly who's a participant on each subnet and then uses that to verify messages and then liquidity. There's obviously a lot of developers that are already building on the C chain. There's already, you know, I think every stable coin you can, you can launch um, are all on the C chain and it'd be great to be able for any subnet just to take those in and do something with them without having to have, at least for different teams, integrating with 50 chains. So, um, and I think that the part, people often ask me like what gets me excited about this architecture, like am I having fun? Uh, <laughs> and the answer to that is yes. I think one of the most exciting but underexplored aspects of crypto is exploring what we'll call uh, like the long tail of user interaction. And I think this is not too hot of a take um, that when you have transactions that cost even 10 cents to a dollar, $10 or whatever, uh, there's only certain things you'll do on chain. Um, and I think that the world will be a better place with a lot more on chain. And so by having like uh, architectures that allow for much more scalable interaction, but still interconnected with each other, I think is a, a very exciting uh, place to be. And I think that Avalanche is pretty uniquely positioned to, to serve that void. So uh, if you saw on Twitter, and you can, if you want a full res version of this, uh, uh, Goon posted a, uh, the full PNG uh, of the roadmap uh, that we, we feel like Avalanche should follow uh, over the next uh, few years, uh, or not really next year. Um, and so it breaks down into three main categories. Uh, I actually forgot to update. Oh, this is right. Um, so the first one, uh, and I'm not sure if you can see from back there, and apologize if not. Like I said, it's on Twitter if you want to see the full res version. Uh, the first thing is elevating subnets. So right now, as most people have pointed out, uh, there's a very tight coupling between subnets uh, and the primary network. Um, for e any number of reasons, um, that's not the optimal path, uh, path forward for folks and what uh, subnet builders can do. Um, and so a lot of this roadmap is into adding important features that are necessary to really launch your own community on a subnet, but also making it more robust by better separating it from the primary network. Um, and so uh, you can see we're, we're pretty much here right now on this Durango side where we're adding a few things. Um, and when, when the upgrade was originally shared, uh, a number of people asked, okay, like, cool, you want to disable non-BLS staking, but we don't understand how that fits into anything. With the roadmap now available, uh, you can see exactly how that fits in, which is that it pushes uh, on-chain voting on the P chain to a much more scalable place, which will allow for much lower uh, if the network or if the community decides much lower cost to launch a subnet and then add validators to the subnet. Um, and so the other important things here for, especially for users is uh, the introduction of continuous staking. So this will, for the first time, let you just stake and then forget about it. So it'll just kind of keep staking and automatically restake all of your rewards for you in your stake. Um, and then there's a few other niceties here uh, for subnet developers, which is the ability to take uh, ERC 20s from the C chain and use those as uh, your staking asset uh, within subnets. So you launch a token on the C chain, uh, you're able to use that to stake uh, on your subnet um, and then also reward people with that token uh, on, the, on the P chain. And then uh, one other thing I'll call out here is this subnet driven validator sets. So the other big request we got from a lot of different folks was, uh, hey, I have a subnet you know, the P-Chain has a mechanism to create permissionless networks, but that reward curve or like those staking parameters or like the way I want to do fees doesn't really fit with that. Subnet-driven validator sets basically say, works with us, <laughs> give the subnet full control over the staking set. You can stake whatever you want. You can give fees however you want. Just tell the P-Chain uh, who the participants are and what their relative weight is so that when you send a warp message out, anyone else can still verify that warp message, even though you have arbitrary logic that's controlling the staking set. Um, so when people talk about really having their own network and really doing their own thing, but still being connected to the whole, that's I think the, you know, really the evolution, final evolution of that idea. So we're pretty excited about that. And that was actually something uh, I think Aaron posted earlier today. There's a discussion on the ACPs about that. Uh, so that's a really fun one. Uh, the next one uh, I wanted to touch on in particular because I think a lot of people uh, assume when we talk about scale, they're like, well, uh, if you ask the Avalanche, it's like three people walk into a bar, different chains there. But no, on, on the Avalanche, you walk in, people would say, 
oh, there, there's a scaling problem, just create more subnets. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that could be, uh, it's a little true, but there's, there's some untrue there, which is to say that we don't believe or like think that single chain scaling is important. Uh, and I don't think that's further from the truth. We invest you know, considerable resources in developing high performance uh, blockchain solutions, um, headlined by two primary things. One is the Hyper SDK, which a number of folks have heard about. Um, with the incorporation of Rix, which is our uh, scaling engine that powers the Hyper SDK, and then also proprietary research uh, into state management or better state management, which we believe to be, uh, you know, one of the primary bottlenecks of, of scaling blockchains. And so we've been working on Firewood, I think in one way or another for about two years, and the Hyper SDK for about a year and a half. Um, you know, these things take time, unfortunately. So. Uh, we're just working as hard as we can to get them into a place that we think we can really use them to drive exciting performance. But the, our goal in our North Star is per chain to hit 100,000 TPS, um, which is a lofty goal, but something we think with the, the tools we have in place that we can hit and sustain. Uh, not a spiky 100,000, but something that we can sustain at that level. Um, so the other thing I wanted to call out on this particular part is uh, particularly the solidity support. So. Uh, in recent weeks, we found out how we could actually integrate uh, EVM processing support optionally into the Hyper SDK so that you don't have to actually learn a whole new programming environment to use the Hyper SDK with contracts. So we think that'll be a really interesting path for folks that uh, you know, are just Solidity native that want a different environment to deploy onto. Um, so we think a combination of these things and then maintaining a series of uh, different environments that uh, people can use with the Hyper SDK out of the box uh, is a really interesting path for really the single chain scaling approach to Avalanche, where you have a, a native stack built from the ground up, optimized for what Avalanche has to offer. And then last but definitely not least, um, is related to snappy and reliable experiences for anyone that's interacting, whether that be users or people launching subnets. So you can have really cool stuff, but if it goes down all the time, you know, what good, what good is that for a lot of applications? And so uh, we also do a considerable amount of work and think that uh, it'll be important to continue that work uh, to make uh, Avalanche consensus more robust uh, and to make finalization quicker. Um, the way that we're primarily doing that is through this new thing we've been working on called error-based finality. So right now uh, with Avalanche consensus, you do a number of consecutive polls and that's, those are basically hard-coded constants. So K, alpha, and then how many subsequent polls you do. Um, we're changing that and allowing it to be error-based. So you can look in hindsight and say, hey, you know, right now you would go, I, have, I need 20 consecutive polls of at least 15 votes. Now you'd be able to say, well, I had 10 consecutive votes, all with 10 consecutive polls, all with 20 votes. That may actually give me a higher confidence that something's finalized than, uh, than the 20 polls. And so I can just stop polling and finish early. So it should reduce the number of round trips on average, we think to below one second true block finality, uh, which will be pretty good, especially on a, a network with like over a couple thousand validators. Um, and then uh, that should also allow us to do a fast confirmation API if you're willing to accept a little bit higher error probability. So, you know, maybe one time out of 100, that transaction reverts. Uh, and so uh, for different wallet experiences, people have asked for that. So. Uh, and then lastly, a uh, frosty consensus up in the top right uh, is a mechanism that should hopefully allow us to s far surpass the square root and bound um, theoretical result for avalanche liveness. So. Yeah, that's the gist. So uh, if anyone has any questions, happy to take them. Yeah. Yeah, Uzma? Yeah, so uh, the idea with Frosty um, is that uh, in a large network like Avalanche where you have you know, a couple thousand, I think we're at 1,800 or 1,900 validators right now, uh, it's not really, unless, you have with, unless with great cost, possible to do like an all-to-all -all broadcast uh, consensus. So the, one of the big benefits of Avalanche is that there's a logarithmic uh, network complexity growth as the, as the network grows, the number of participants, the issue, However, is that uh, as noted, noted in the paper that some of the liveness uh, can deteriorate when you have a lower than ideal number of Byzantine participants on the network. Well, lower than ideal meaning the amount's lower, not that the Byzantine's ideal. Um, and uh, Frosty is basically a mechanism that is a all-to-all -all fallback 
that in the case where the network is challenged or there's like some issue or like there's some large Byzantine adversary, it can fall back to all to all broadcast to remove uh, whatever validators or parties um, are currently causing it to get into that state to then hopefully return back to the fast path. Uh, while we're investigating that, we're also obviously investigating ways to improve the actual liveness of the fast path. Um, but uh, it's, it's really like a uh, Armageddon style recovery system in the case where you have like a large network partition or like some large adversary and you want to be able to evict whoever is causing instability from the network or at least continue confirming transactions. Yeah. So I think that's a, a really good point to bring up. Um, the truth is it affected subnets more than we wanted. Um, now it shouldn't have. However, uh, because of the tight coupling with the primary network and subnets and how they like uh, basically communicate with each other, uh, there was when the P chain started to have issues, some of the subnets who were using the P chain to determine like the ordering of proposers uh, in the block production um, were on different heights of the P chain. Typically that's permissible within some bounds and it works fine, but in this case, it, it wasn't. And so then what happens is proposers would produce blocks with P chain heights that some people didn't have and they would consider the block invalid. And so then you got stuck in this problem where some subnets were in there. As soon as liveness returned to the P chain and the P chain heights that like those folks didn't have were received, it just continued like normal. Um, but you can see here, that's definitely one of the things that, uh, you know, we want to improve. Um, prior to the introduction of Proposer VM, uh, that would not have been a problem. It's just the way that the ordering or like kind of like the leadering mechanism is designed for subnets. And so one of the things that's interesting to us is this like pluggable consensus or like configurable consensus algorithms where you can push some of the logic that is by default referencing the P chain and do something else on your own in your subnet that is just fully isolated. Um, so the end case we're trying to get to basically is to say, hey, if there's some issue with the primary network, God forbid, we're hopefully should make that simpler so that's even less likely to happen. But in the case there is, all that would happen is your subnet would maybe have a delayed view of other validators on the network and the P chain would have a delayed view of your validators instead of just stopping. Seems like a better outcome. So, for, I mean, the issue with a lot of outages on like any large like L1 is that it's never planned. <laughs> and so I think the case with Frosty is it's best working when you have some sort of out, like uh, outage of nodes where there's like a large shutdown of participants um, or that those participants are Byzantine. But in the case where there's like a bug like there was last week, unclear. Like, that one probably wouldn't have helped because they were saturating like the basically the bandwidth that was allocated to them on other peers wouldn't matter what consensus algorithm you were running couldn't get messages through to other validators yeah so hopefully there's a release going out today also that we redesign the entire gossip engine after that so that was a fun few days yeah Yeah, I mean, so the, the goal with that is um, if you provide more hardware, you can continue scaling up. The hope still is that even with regular hardware, it can be really perform performant. The way we look at it and like the metrics we care about are how many transactions can you process per dollar? And what is the price to users for processing that many transactions at that level? So like, you know, maybe you can process one trend, like a thousand transactions for a dollar, but if you try to do 2000 transactions, it becomes like $5 or something, like where it rapidly escalates. The hope is that you can have a very low price point, uh, you know, a lot of transactions per dollar, and then you can process still a lot at that point. Um, so when we're thinking about technologies to adopt, that's it. Like whether it be ZK, whether it be, you know, Hyper SDK with Rix, whether it be some sort of EVM or some sort of database, that, those are the two numbers we care about. Um, right now, we feel like the best way to hit those numbers is with our stack, Hyper SDK, um, and then with this scaling engine, Rix. And so the idea there with 
what we can do or like what the variables are that make this happen is really all bricks in terms of like what will allow that. So um, by taking a pretty aggressive approach to apply decoupled state machine replication, which lets you propagate data prior to its inclusion on chain. So you can just better use the network bandwidth available to nodes. Uh, we think that you can um, really juice the performance up. Um, and the same thing with Vrix was it's not just like some paper to write a paper. Uh, as we were optimizing the Hyper SDK, we got to this point with the traditional like kind of state machine replication approach where we kept throwing more hardware at it and then it just stopped getting better. At that point, you like either say, well, that's the cap or <laughs> you say, well, where, where does it get stuck and like what we have to do? And then as we were doing that, it became like, well, shoot, we're gonna have to really <laughs> go deep here. And so that ended up being the Vrix project. Um, so it was in direct response to issues that we were seeing trying to take the Hyper SDK up to the level we wanted to get it to. So uh, in short, uh, theoretical changes into how blocks are propagated on the network and how transactions are propagated on the network is the key. Um, and then the variables there are hopefully you add more hardware, you just keep going up. But obviously there's bottlenecks you'll hit eventually. Yeah. So. Cool. Anybody else? All righty. Well, enjoy Avalanche Hacks. Um, if you uh, want to check this stuff out, it should all be public, published uh, publicly, and you can obviously reach out on Twitter or GitHub or something. But yeah, thanks. Thank you.